Happy Darwin Day y'all! This is a very overdue sequel to the video done by Budget Museum of the first three layers off the Darwin Iceberg. I like lists and therefore I also like icebergs, but I end up including too much information per entry because what is the point of learning just the simplest, most googleable sound bites of information? Anyway, sorry for the delay and here is the rest of the iceberg. Layer 4 When Life Gives You Lemons The Official Naturalist on the Beagle Despite his fame as the HMS Beagle's naturalist, Darwin was not the ship's official naturalist. Meet Robert McCormick, the ship's official physician and naturalist on the ship's second voyage under Captain Fitzroy. He was educated and experienced, yet he often disagreed and felt undervalued. He couldn't share the captain's table and couldn't visit the shore as easily as Darwin since the surgery was low grade in the navy. Darwin was permitted to land and interact with the top classes of the colonies. Despite their dislike for one another, they were cordial. When Fitzroy arranged for Darwin's collection to be wrapped and brought back to England in April 1832, McCormick became dissatisfied and abandoned the journey at Rio. Following that, Darwin became the official naturalist of the Beagle, while McCormick became the physician of James Ross's Antarctic voyage. McCormick and his helper encountered Darwin at Charing Cross in 1843. This assistant's name was Joseph Hooker. Pangenesis Pangenesis was Charles Darwin's theorized method for heredity, in which he believed that each portion of the organism constantly issued its own sort of microscopic organic particle called gemmules, which gathered in the gonads and contributed irritable information to the gametes. In his 1868 article, The Variation of Animals and Plants Under Domestication, he developed this provisional hypothesis to address a key vacuum in evolutionary theory at the time. Despite Darwin's efforts to defend his idea, Galton and Westman's test disproved it. Following the discovery of genetics, Soviet scientists used this mechanism to validate Lysenkoism. Annie's Box Anne Darwin, Darwin's eldest daughter, died when she was only 10 years old. Around the year 2000, Randall Keynes, Darwin's great-great-grandson, discovered a box containing Anne's mementos. Darwin and his wife Emma had gathered the contents of the box. Keynes would subsequently publish a biographical novel titled Annie's Box on Darwin's relationship with Anne. The plot for the 2009 film Creation was inspired by the book. Botanist Darwin Darwin is primarily renowned for his work in zoology, yet he also wrote about and was a famous botanist. His botanical work contains numerous papers and observations, but also a few very well-designed experiments, which are still quoted in college textbooks today. His passion in plants seems to have continued from boyhood, when he displayed aptitude in flower identification, to maturity when he published many articles in botanical journals and had frequent communication with several prominent botanists, including Joseph Hooker. Darwin's book on orchids, beautifully titled On the Various Contrivances by Which British and Foreign Orchids Are Fertilized by Insects, is widely regarded as his most significant contribution to the field. He continued to conduct plant experiments until his death. Political Darwin Along with natural history, Darwin was interested in the politics of his day. The Darwins and Wedgwoods were vocal abolitionists who advocated for the abolition of slavery. Many times, in his publications, Charles argued against slavery even with Lyle and Fitzroy. Despite being affected by Victorian common views at the time and hesitance to interact with free thinkers, his contributions to evolution helped numerous human rights groups to succeed. He advocated liberal changes as a Whig and interacted with politicians and other political people on multiple occasions. Things Named After Darwin Many objects carry Darwin's name since he was one of the greatest scientists of the 19th century. Though the majority of these objects are linked to taxonomy or zoology, locations, ideas, and organizations have also been named after him. Darwinopteris, Darwin's Rhea, 
Charles Darwin National Park, Social Darwinism, the Darwin Awards, and Darwin City are all examples of each. Darwin's Phrenological Analysis Phrenology is a pseudoscience that involves measuring the bumps on the human head in order to predict mental qualities. This was quite popular among the nobility and other classes throughout the Victorian period. A few years ago, the secretaries of a German psychological society asked me earnestly by letter for a photograph of myself, and sometimes afterwards I received the proceedings of one of the meetings in which it seemed that the shape of my head had been the subject of a public discussion, and one of the speakers declared that I had the bump of reverence developed enough for ten priests, Darwin writes in his autobiography. Deathbed Conversion a deathbed conversion is, as the term indicates, a religious conversion that occurs soon before death, frequently on one's deathbed. Darwin is possibly the most well-known purported deathbed conversion story. According to Protestant evangelist Elizabeth Lady Hope, on his deathbed, Darwin voiced concern and sorrow over sharing his ideas on the theory of evolution. She further alleges he requested her to organize a crowd so that he could speak to them about Christ Jesus and his redemption. The Boston Watchman Examiner reported the article. Both Darwin's son Francis and daughter Henrietta, however, strongly refuted the account, accusing Lady Hope of manufacturing it. Whether or not it happened is largely irrelevant to the theory of evolution as it stands today. Chemist Darwin in 1822, Erasmus Darwin became interested in chemistry and set up a lab in their garden shed, hiring Charles as his assistant. They began conducting experiments after purchasing the necessary apparatuses and chemical books. But since Erasmus had to attend university, Charles was left to experiment with chemicals on his own. Charles received the nicknames Gas and Poco Carante from his classmates and instructor due to his stinky shed, but he continued to study chemistry until he was 15 and ready to start hunting. Darwin to Charles Marx Relations Charles Darwin and Karl Marx were undoubtedly the most prominent scientific and philosophical minds of the 19th century, and both spent large periods of their careers in the UK, so it's no wonder that they were at least passingly acquainted with each other. Though they lived just 20 miles apart, the two never met, but Marx had a lot to say about Darwin's work, both praising and annoyed by aspects of it. Marx and Darwin had a short exchange of letters in 1873, commencing with a letter Marx sent signed to Charles Darwin from a loyal admirer, from Karl Marx. Darwin eventually answered, thanking him, despite the fact that he had never read any of Marx's books and was hesitant to begin conversation with him, normally shying away from combining his own scientific theories with political ones. Seems a little hypocritical considering his political connections. Juan Manuel de Rosas Juan Manuel de Rosas was an Argentine army lieutenant who eventually became the head of a military junta in the province of Buenos Aires. Darwin met de Rosas on his Beagle voyage and first thought of him as a man of unusual character. Following the advent of de Rosas' dictatorship, Darwin would subsequently retract this opinion, claiming that his former view of de Rosas had been completely and tragically incorrect. Darwin, on the other hand, regarded the troops under de Rosas' leadership to be absolutely repulsive from the start. Galapagos was a gulag. When one thinks of Darwin's landing in Galapagos, one may picture a totally deserted island. However, Darwin and his crew were not alone. Ecuador seized the islands on February 12, 1832 and utilized them as a prison colony, importing convicts, later craftsmen and farmers, to settle the islands. The exiles were forced to survive on little water and tortoise flesh far from any ships. In September of 1835, Darwin met Nicholas Lawson, a Norwegian-born Englishman who had previously lived in the United States, Canada, fought in the Chilean War of Independence before becoming Ecuador's governor of the islands. He demonstrated to Darwin how to identify all of the tortoise species on each island. The islands were designated as a national park in the mid-20th century. Backgammon Wars 
Charles and Emma were inseparable, but there was one game in which they became bitter rivals, backgammon. Every night they played two games of backgammon. All of the visitors enjoyed watching their games. Darwin had a score of 2796 in 1876, while Emma received a score of 2490. HMS Beagle's Other Missions The major purpose of HMS Beagle's second trip, as many people know, was to survey the coastlines of South America and carry a chain of chronometrical measurements around the world. Or was it? As previously discussed, Captain Robert Fitzroy attempted to establish a mission at Tierra del Fuego, but the crew also had some other diplomatic objectives. They visited disputed territories, quelled a mutiny in Montevideo with Darwin and 50 well-armed men, arrested Antonio Rivero in the Falkland Islands, met with Queen Promare of Tahiti, policed the seas around Tahiti, collected $3,000 compensation for a ship plundered two years earlier in the Low Islands, and so on. Darwin's Glenroy Theory Despite his significant contributions to biology and geology, Darwin committed some errors. During Queen Victoria's coronation in June 1838, he took a vacation to Scotland. While admiring the scenery of Glenroy, he did what any of us would do. He made copious notes on the Glen and began to create hypotheses regarding the origin of parallel roads there. He compared Glenroy's parallel roads to Coquimbo's terraces and concluded that the shorelines were elevated beaches of marine origin. In 1839, he presented his idea in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. This was refuted a year later by Louis Agassiz, a Swiss-American geologist known as the discoverer of Megalodon and the CEO of scientific racism. His glacial hypothesis proposed that the Glenroy shorelines were carved by lock ice freeze thaw cycles. Despite his efforts to defend his hypothesis, Darwin abandoned it after he read T. F. Jameson's in 1863. Wallace to Darwin Relations Alfred Russell Wallace was the guy who nearly developed the idea of evolution through natural selection before Darwin. One may wonder what happened to these co-discoverers later. What did they think of one another? How was the relationship between them? Darwin regarded Wallace as one of the few people who genuinely grasped his theory, yet they disagreed on many points. For example, Darwin endorsed the theory of sexual selection to explain colors and sexual dimorphism. However, Wallace was so convinced in natural selection that he dismissed it, claiming that they were a type of defense or camouflage mechanism. Moreover, unlike Darwin, Wallace had previously advocated for evolution and the fundamental purpose of his voyages was to discover a mechanism for it. Aside from science, they were diametrically opposed. Darwin was a rich middle-class man with successful investments, whereas Wallace was a poor and very unlucky writer with several unsuccessful investment efforts. Darwin and the X Club even provided a pension for him. Wallace also advocated for spiritualism and socialism, which Darwin strongly opposed. Wallace seems kinda based, to be honest. Wallace, on the other hand, never ceased supporting his friend's beliefs until his death. The Variation of Animals and Plants Under Domestication The Variation of Animals and Plants Under Domestication is a book by Darwin published in 1868. The book includes detailed information on the domestication of animals and plants, but it also contains the explanation of Darwin's theory of heredity, aka pangenesis. First meant to be part of the origin, Darwin kept explaining the mechanisms of variation and challenged the idea of divinely guided variation, which was supported by Asa Gray. Darwin's Insect Collection Darwin is well known as a prolific collector of animal specimens, as was custom for Victorian scientists, and insects were no exception. He began his obsessive collecting as a child and would continue to do so for much of the rest of his life. Among his many fields of expertise was entomology, and during his voyage on the HMS Beagle, another of his duties was identifying bugs, many of which he would also collect and create extensive notes for. Many of Darwin's insect collections are still available to view in various museums around the world. And that, my friends, was the Darwin Iceberg. 
The script for this iceberg was originally written or constructed by Elwin Alies of the Instagram account Extinct Animal Facts. He reached out to Budget Museum and myself quite a while ago to get this ball rolling, and it is entirely my own fault for my section taking so long. Hope you enjoyed. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my elephant tier patrons Arda Bear, Biotiverse, Christoph Hubbinger, Dinosaur, Isaiah Garza, PA Brew News, Ray, Rudy Redgrave, Smiling Walrus. And another thanks to my Tyrannosaurus tier patrons Iberospinus, Iron Bladesman, Swaffles is Weird, Teeny Dragator, The Dogman.